My name is Kimberly Tabalone, and I'm a reference and instruction librarian here. The library hosts this series almost every Thursday because we see it as an extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. So whether or not you can personally relate to everything you hear in here, we want everyone to have access to a wide range of viewpoints and expertise that we can learn and grow from each other's experiences and understanding. So, I'll ask that when we have our discussion part, uh, portion of this session, um, that folks are actively engaged and that we keep the discussion collegial and uh, respectful. At the end of this, I'll be asking you all to fill out a very brief survey asking what went well, what you'd like to see in the future, so that we can keep this series relevant and interesting to you all. I'm already planning, this is like my show, I'm already planning the winter quarter schedule, and if you are passionate about a topic and want to lead the session, you can come and talk to me. We have faculty, staff, students, and community members, but I especially love when we have students come and lead these sessions. So, up here you'll notice some selected books. If you are doing research on this or a similar topic, you're welcome to check any of these out, or if you're just personally interested. Um, and if you're interested in resources other than these, you can check out the reference desk, big desk in the middle of the library, and there will be a librarian who is happy to help you find what you need. So in two weeks, December 5th, we'll have our last COSI of the quarter, and that will be on the limits of identity politics, and that will be led by two faculty members here. But this week, I want you to join me in giving a very warm welcome as we have a very timely session on the environmental costs of an animal-based diet feeding a 9 billion people Earth and the role of individual choices. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gad Lee, the Senior Research Scientist at Northwest Research Associates. Gad. Thank you. So um, this, in general, broadly falls into the topic of climate and climate change. Um, and I have served five years on the U.S. Climate Variability and Predictability uh, Panel, which is a program of the UN that deals with uh, the roles of oceans uh, in the climate system. And uh, this is one part that I've chosen where it's easy for people to take individual responsibility. Um, so everybody would have excuses, but basically the point is that you can and you need to know how to deal with your excuses and do the right thing. Um, We'll try to give basically 15 minutes introduction and facts and then open it to, to the conversation. I have some pointers of, uh, so I will review uh, and that most of the work is actually other researchers' work, it's not my own. Um, and then I will share some resources for further information uh, on how individual choices can be assessed, uh, which I don't, I will not talk here, and then I'll open it to a conversation. Some of the resources that are already displayed there, and there is probably one other that you can uh, download. Uh, so the main point and some uh, GHG that we've referred in the past, that's greenhouse gases. So um, who is 
not familiar with the concept of greenhouse gas. Okay, so our atmosphere and the ocean, uh, our atmosphere works as a, and the ocean, which is the climate system, they work as a big thermodynamic um, engine that is, well, for those of you, you're from all over, you know that the climate and the weather changes all over, but we normally have a much warmer equator and tropical areas, and we have cooling, and that drives an overall, our overall climate system where uh, we try to, uh, or the, the, the system tries to equilibrate. And then there are gases uh, in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is all, uh, compri comprises all of gas that work as a greenhouse gases, which means they trap heat. Uh, pretty much similar to how a greenhouse works. So if you are familiar with greenhouse, uh, and overall, this is not, not bad. That's what allows us to live on an inhabitable um, planet. Okay? It, keeps our, it keeps our planet warmer than it would have otherwise be uh, if, if all the solar radiation, which is the main the main source of radiation was just reflected back. So some of it is uh, trapped in the atmosphere. The problem uh, with climate and climate change is that uh, our economy uh, has, we uh, emit a lot of artificial or man-made greenhouse gases and that uh, over time causes the atmosphere to warm and the climate to change, the climate to be overall warmer. Not uniformly, which means that it has uh, implications to our climate and that means to our how we live and how we used to live, uh, as opposed to how we used to live, how the economy is, uh, is structured. Uh, the primary one that you probably heard of is CO2, carbon dioxide. That's the one that is being emitted uh, by engines, by cars. Uh, again, it, on its own, it's a naturally occurring one. We wouldn't be, we, uh, when we breathe, we do emit carbon dioxide. Uh, so it's part, it's part, necessary part of life. Question is well, when we uh, when we uh, shake the, the balance and uh, so that's that's the one that you probably heard most of. Others that have actually even higher uh, greenhouse effects are methane. Do you know what methane is? That's CH, CH4, it's another carbon, it's the one that um, is associated with, um, well, car droppings and the uh, foul smelling one. Um, and uh, another one that people, most people are not aware of is actually water vapor, it is a greenhouse gas. Uh, both those actually are even more, more warming. So if you notice living here that in winter, in winter nights we have, uh, we have warmer winter nights when it's cloudy uh, and much colder when it's clear, that's because we have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, water vapor in the air and the clouds work and so they work as a, as a greenhouse. Uh, the reason that uh, most of the attention is on carbon dioxide is because it's a uh, residence time or the time that the time that it uh, lasts 
once it's emitted in the atmosphere and in the ocean, uh, is much, much longer better than bubble um, tea. A couple of hundred years, while water vapor and others, we precipitate it, so uh, it's easier to control. Um, and so that's why most of the focus is on uh, on um, CO2 or carbon dioxide. But overall, the point that I'm make, we are making here, because we all eat and eat food, and the point is that feeding us is a significant greenhouse source. And if we are looking at the UN Conference on Trade and Development report, uh, so non-food related emissions contribute all about 50%, between 43 and 56% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and sources, while um, food-related food one uh, accounts for the rest. So that is a significant part, and you can see here the the uh, distribution between waste, processing, transport, packing, and retail, uh, land use changes, and deforestation, deforestation and uh, agricultural product. Uh, and of the um, food-related component of greenhouse gas emissions, livestock have a major major part and they have a major environmental cost. Uh, they dominate the anthropogenic, everybody know what anthropogenic means? Okay, that's main made land use. So um, uh, grazing and feed production uh, takes about 70% 70, 70 of agricultural land and 30% of the global land. And this is the key reason for tropical deforestation. I will not, uh, soil loss and anti antibiotic overuse. And for those of you who are following the current global news other than impeachment hearing, uh, you may be hearing about the burning Amazon. And burning Amazon is exactly that. It is being burned to make room for, uh, for ranches and cattle. Um, and roughly one-fifth of the global and the U.S. emissions are due to livestock. So if we were talking about 50% overall, 50% uh, uh, so it's about 50% of the 50% that we assign to um, food production. Uh, it also undermines biodiversity, and you can see here the number of top wild species that are killed annually by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and Wildlife Services due to farmers and rancher, ranchers' request, and that goes to for 10 years to between 2000, 2000, 2001, 2011. Um, and uh, so overall, feeding animals to feed people is a pretty inefficient way of feeding people as opposed to a more direct one. Uh, it globally relocates high quality resources that are currently used by livestock and then it can feed an additional 10 to the 9, how many millions is that? That's a billion people, I think. Uh, 10 to the 6 is 1 million, so it's one yeah, 1 million people. Uh, and it's 
it's really very inefficient. So we, uh, what I've done or what Bruselius has done here is calculated the input versus the output. So that's the ratio. And the output is what we consume as, as we can. So from plants, the input versus the output is one and a half, uh, while for animals, it's 31. So um, it's 20, 20 times less efficient than eating plants directly in terms of our, what we gain out of it, our nutrition, what we need to leave and to digest. Uh, it's also a major land grabber. Uh, in total U.S. land, it's 2.3 billion acres, acres, and in the lower 48, it's 1.9 billion acres. And uh, we have the breakdown here in terms of the percentage of crops are. Uh, 18% versus pasture and range grazed and grazed for, uh, forest land, which is just under 40%, and that's all used for big feed energy. Uh, and as, uh, uh, in comparison, where we are looking at just vegetables and the, the main vegetable crops, apples, oranges, lettuce, and, and tomatoes, those are at, at less than 1%. Uh, so animal-based diets are more environmentally cost, costly. However, um, people continue eating them. Um, and so uh, one other question is, if we had a choice, if you had to eat so many uh, calories from animals, how environmentally different is it, would it be to choose beef over poultry, over eggs, or over, over pork? Uh, and then uh, the other thing that I'm going to give is some uh, numbers about replacing all animal-based calories or just beef. If we, if I can convince you at the end of this presentation that beef is the major culprit. Uh, and the other question is, can we get everything that we need nutritionally uh, from plants or from uh, alter from those alternatives, and we'll address the things too. Uh, so we are going to divide the four environmentally important non-total national costs, and that's referring to the U.S. to the portion due to those four um, or five categories of animal-based foods. One is eggs, the other one is uh, poultry, uh, the other one is uh, beef in terms of eating, pork, and uh, cattle but used for milk, so for dairy. And I should mention that most of the research that I I'm, uh, I'm citing here is done by uh, Eshel and um, collaborators. Still continues doing it. Um, so here are the resources of producing uh, the feed needed for to, uh, what is it, 10,000 human edible kilocalories, okay? So there, uh, this, all the calculations here are made on a per calorie basis. And that is good because when I give this uh, to
talk at different places when I give it, if I gave it, for example, in China, the um, usual argument of the Chinese, well, how is it per capita? So we are not putting that much burden if you look at it per capita. No, it doesn't, as long as you eat that many calories as anybody else and the sources. So the, the, all the calculations are based on calorie, and you can see the uh, different categories, dairy, um, and the amount of resources that it, it takes, and the columns here are uh, lands, irrigated water, greenhouse gas, reactive nitrogen, which is another um, pollutant that usually pollutes our, uh, our ocean and our rivers. Uh, and, and then on the right is how much of this is used in the mean uh, US diet. And that's based on uh, US Department of Agriculture and the, uh, US Department of Health uh, statistics. And you can see that, all, and then the, just in the land column, you would see uh, the, the solid one and then the, uh, the one that is additional. The additional one is the one that is used if we are looking at at gray, at the, the source at, is, is in gray. That is, if we are going to go for a grass-fed uh, <coughs> beef, it actually grabs more land. Um, and that's uh, the same thing with, uh, with dairy. And you can see that in just in every uh, category, beef requires uh, about 10 times more resources per calorie than any other animal category. Uh, um, and then within the other ones, uh, they are on the same order of magnitude. So if you decide to give up beef in favor of uh, poultry, pork, eggs, or dairy, overall you are doing about the same. So you have a choice there. So if you don't eat pork because it's not halal, you have other choices. You still don't have to. You don't have the excuse of going back to beef. Um, and so the, the previous one was in terms of, oops, in terms of uh, uh, energy, and this one is in terms of producing the feed needed for one kilogram of human edible protein. We need both carbohydrates, energy, and protein to live. And pretty much the same picture uh, emerges again. Uh, the details change somewhat between what we eat. Uh, pork seem to be uh, a little more burdensome than uh, poultry or, or eggs. But uh, it's still true that beef is roughly 10, 10 times, 10, 10 fold more resource intensive and the other for, for uh, roughly comparable. Um, so here are the, again, the, diff, the different uh, categories and uh, the resources that they take as a percentage of overall by, uh, by each category, 
and you can see the red again dominates just about everything uh, and land because of pasture so if we some people would object to it but if we wanted to have a more uh, a more effective less burdensome beef we shouldn't use pasture uh, and then uh, there's a table here about the uh, conversion conversion feed to food uh, conversion efficiency that means out of that much feed that we give to the animal how much do we get once we consume it and that goes to uh, and that's broken in energy and protein and uh, so you can see that actually the more efficient part would be uh, eggs and dairy and beef and dairy is the least efficient one that three percent in terms of energy and two percent in terms of uh, protein. Uh, now you may ask what what happens um, in other resources and how it how does it compare to actual um, to um, actual staple foods which are plant based and here you can see it comparing it to apples potatoes wheat and rice those are the main staple foods uh, and um, you can see that again uh, and then you have all the categories too and other than um, all animal based items except for uh, beef require less water per calorie than apples and rice so the only uh, the only resources that uh, apples and rice, some of the uh, plant-based one, is consuming more, and again, not more than beef, is water, purely water. Um, and now, another question is, can we, nutritionally, can we replace our um, our meat-based <coughs> our meat-based diet by a uh, plant-based diet and get all the nutrition on the all the nutrition that we need uh, and the table here uh, on the left the column gives suggest suggestions of plant-based diets that will replace uh, 768 kilocalories kilo per day, which is uh, what the statistics say the, the uh, average adult U.S. diet uh, is doing, and uh, apparently we can. And then on the left, uh, there is the. Uh, The, uh, some of the savings in terms of the resources uh, and so if we do the, this uh, substitute the animal based by plant based we are going to say we are going to be only at 27-29% of the burden that we have uh, by using it and then under that is how, how are all our nutrients doing? Um, and uh, you can see there are only two that we're going to miss. One is cholesterol. Luckily, 
we can, our bodies produces cholesterol on its own. We don't know most problems that people have with how is having eating too much cholesterol rather than having too little. Uh, currently, on the average, I think we produce about 80% of this. And the other one is uh, vitamin B12. This is the only uh, nutrient vitamin that we can you cannot get purely from uh, plant-based diet. Uh, so if we agree that we can't get people to stop eating meat altogether, how about replacing only beef with plants? And that would be about 190 kilocalories or 65 grams per person per day, again, based on the statistics of the uh, US diet. And uh, here again on the, on the left is the amount of the amount of resources needed, and you can see that um, beef, which is the red, is at, well, at times 20, 20 times more per cent. Uh, and then the replacement content, and again, what we would, uh, the only thing that we are going to miss is the only two things are we're going to miss are B, uh, vitamin B12 and cholesterol. Uh, but in terms of the environmental uh, savings, a high quality crop uh, cropland, we are looking about. Uh, the savings is about 23% of the national cropland or the size of the state of Montana. In terms of rangeland, we are talking about 36% of the lower 48 or the size of uh, California, Texas, and Arkansas. And in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we are talking about 46 of all agriculture, 46 percent of all agricultural uh, emissions. So almost half of all agricultural emissions, or about the emissions of about 16 million Americans. So uh, kind of the takeaway points before I open it for discussion is the less animal you eat, the lower your diet's environmental footprint is. And it is really the beef, then pork, poultry, dairy, and eggs, which are about tenfold less, and then most plants. And then plants cost in terms of environmental burden, except for irrigation, are several times to two orders of magnitude lower than livestock. And with the additional health benefit and the additional benefit that those are easily within the power of an individual to choose because some of the other choices you may not have always. Depending on where you live, you can't choose who is going to provide how much how much, how is your energy going to be provided when you switch on the light? Um, but in choices of food, uh, you can. And then uh, I think I am going to end in here. I uh, will open it to the conversation topics and questions, and I suggested some, some of those. One is 
I made it all sound so easy. Why is it so hard? Um, and there are probably many reasons. Another is why is it that beef is so much more burdensome environmentally and resource than others? Uh, are there other alternatives in terms of food or, or other actions that we can take as individuals? Um, are there any other barriers to changing cultural, cultural, religious, cost, economical, etc.? Uh, what about gas? grass fed beef, uh, I actually showed a little bit, but uh, it's a common, a common thought that that would be environmentally more uh, friendly. And I haven't talked at all about seafood, which is another major source of food. Uh, I I'm giving you here a resource for those of you who want to explore that. Uh, and there is the, uh, that is put by the Monterey Bay Aquarium about the su su sustainability and impact of seafood diet choices, including you can get a guide depending on where you live of what's sustainable and what's not, what, what is it where so better alternative and so on. And I think they even have an app. And so you can go there. I haven't addressed it at all. And that's, that was my introduction. So should we have this small group conversation? Yeah. So with the folks who are around you, you can go ahead and discuss some of these questions, reflect on what it is that you just all the information that we've been given and maybe in about 10 minutes we'll come back to the large group and share out some of those thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really nervous about it. Also, I mean, it's hard to convince people to not. And for some reason, the Americans are really like proud of the fact that they want to make, which is weird, but like they're really angry at the things they get. There's a cultural identity for some people about this stuff. Eat, eat, eat. But I'm super concerned because it's obvious that grass fed beef is so much worse environmentally. But that I would not want to go to somebody and be like, well, you can make a big change even by just starting by like not eating grass and beef. So that seems like the whole direction of it ethically. It's like, okay, well, here's one ethical thing, but then like, instead we're gonna like cram all the cows in terrible conditions. I wouldn't want to have it. I feel like that it is. It's, it's, it's just a thing. And it's just one of those things that, like, seeing that grass fed beef is more rich. It makes me sad. It makes me think that people who want to work towards, like, this goal of, like, a better planet, like, could end up at all. Although, I, I also wonder how much. How big is that Venn diagram where people like, care about cow conditions and care about the earth, but also still want to eat cows? I mean, I know a lot of farmers, they care about the earth. Okay, I'm just babbling because I didn't know what you were going to yeah, I don't actually have yeah. the same environmental cost for grass-fed meat. It's actually worse. Yeah, it's just in one of the categories, in the land use category, it's worse. Oh, because yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. natural. 
I didn't yeah. see. Because I didn't mm -hmm. see it. Uh, maybe like the emissions or anything. Or so. I don't know. I would wonder what um, having cattle grazing, like I know the grasslands are also a carbon sink. So I don't know how that plays out. <laughs> Back with their grazing, some of that garbage capture power. It costs much more. I think it's hard because, at least in my personal perspective, the easiest thing to do is just like keep our own space for ourselves and try to be an example of our individual choices. I also think, though, that people could see some of those graphs. But, like, maybe that one where it was like the total resources and it would just be all the way to the top. Like, maybe people would think about it. It's really cool. Like, 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 
I do feel like something has changed, but like I remember, I'm not going to say what year it was, but I remember when I was like six or seven writing a letter to the president about my worries about climate change, and that was a long time ago. And it feels like just now people are actually starting to activate at like a major level. Something that gives me comfort because climate change literally like keeps me up at night and wakes me up early. I'm glad that a lot of people are moving. And I think maybe a lot of those people that are moving probably don't already know specifically about food. Like, you know, like, I think the food conversation has just been like the past five years or so that I've started to hear more about like dietary choices as, 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 as they affect like, you know, local emissions. So, because before I think sometimes you would hear about like pollutants from agriculture or things like that, but like those are the emissions. I mean, there were always jokes about cow parts, but you know, that aside, like, Learning about um, the cell and like uh, reactive nitrogen, you know, I didn't even, and that the effects of methane are actually worse than CO2. So, I said that, you didn't go into that. You did say that, right? Yeah. 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 I wrote it down. <laughs> the thing is, it's the same even seeing like the impossible meats and beyond meats, you know, this is widely available. And like burgers was always good, they always had a lot of patty, you know, like 20 years ago. But like seeing that those are popping up everywhere, that's a sign that people are open to change. And the easier you make it for people to make it for you, the more like, well, at least I'll try it today, you know. Where's the problem? Where's the problem? Where's the problem? What barriers do you guys come up against when you first I mean, like, for you personally, my diet, like, say, like, 12 years as a full vegetarian, I found, like, who I lived with, and that's what like, they're willing to do, and, you know, what their attitudes are, really does make a big difference. But my dad's a big health food nut, and so we didn't need a lot of red meat growing up. But I also know that, like, in their house, like, they are so busy with my niece and, and everything, and, like, they kind of have their staples and, like, have their routine, so, like, it's hard. It's, like, they don't need a lot of beef. Um, my dad is, like, really obsessed with, like, like, healthy balance. So, like, to try to add, like, hey, you know, where are the ethics of this? I think that would just be like a big mental shift and it would be hard to move them at their age and with everything you have to do. But I, I don't know, I mean, yeah, I have 
I, I think. I haven't tried to personally like change any really unlovely people. <laughs> I think it's important because um, a lot of people are on the fence, and I have found that if you cook for someone, they'll kind of like adopt that. And you know, they may they may eat meat when they're not at home, but if you're like living with roommates or whatever, you cook stuff. A lot of people are happy to just like kind of like you can ease them into it. And then like when they're already enjoying it, then like, drop in photos, drop in. Yeah. Like cultural barriers, barriers are big. Though. Like people have, I think, um, even like people's comfort food. Like it's like it's like when like somebody is like like an alcoholic and we can't imagine. Like, so I know that we had some great yeah, conversations at my table. Like, oh, this is the dish. Was there anything? I'm talking about a survey right now. I can't imagine. Oh, I'd love to hear what you all were talking about. What came up at your table? My chair? <laughs> barriers? What were some of the barriers? <laughs> Um, just like convincing people. Mm. So you all are convinced? Mm. No, I think we have our own personal barriers. Yeah. Yeah. Like cultural elements to it. Yeah. Yeah. Which feels like a part of us. You know what I mean? Right? So I want to recognize that we're kind of at the end of our time. So even if you don't have the chance to share as a bit, I hope that you all had good conversation. Continue thinking um, about your food choices, and this is a pretty timely session since next week we have a major holiday coming up, which is usually around the burger. I've had till 13 years. I was at so for you, like, yeah, that was so sad. My little medallion was so funky. You know, I haven't had a corn spake meat though, and or corn spake turkey, and they do a really nice spake chicken. I can say that. Sometimes corn, yeah, it's made, it's made with a. Uh, it's like a, a certain kind of mushroom that is grind up, but it, it tastes just. It tastes just like chicken. It's got a really nice texture. They, they did really well with that. And they they used to just make fillets and the last time I checked because I'm feeling guilty. I'll, I'll like do some kind of vegan. They had like a whole section. They kill you more.